Hello, everyone. This is your host, Mahek Shah, and welcome to a new episode of the Heart Success Podcast, where we discuss practical knowledge and the latest in the field of cardiovascular medicine. All listeners be advised that the podcast is for personal information, education, and entertainment only. Information from this podcast should not be used as medical dictum, and all decisions related to patient care should be made in consultation with care providers. For our fifth episode today, we are going to tackle cardiorenal syndrome. To help us through this conversation, we welcome Dr. Janani Rangaswamy to our show. Dr. Rangaswamy is a world expert in cardiorenal syndrome and a truly phenomenal physician that I have had the pleasure of working with before. Dr. Rangaswamy holds a faculty position at Einstein Medical Center, Sydney Kimmel College of Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia. She recently led the AHA scientific statement on cardiorenal syndrome that just came out in April of 2019. And I read the statement. It's an incredible paper on really getting to understand cardiorenal syndrome, the interaction between the heart and the kidney. I thought it would be a great topic to talk about uh, during one of our initial episodes. And so we have Dr. Rangaswamy with us today. Welcome, Dr. Rangaswamy. Thank you so much, Mehak, for having me on this uh, podcast. It's been a pleasure to watch your growth during residency and fellowship, or, you know, I know you from those days. And I must say, it really makes a nephrologist with an interest in cardiorenal medicine so happy to see that a mentee of theirs imbibes their knowledge and becomes a very talented, advanced heart failure specialist. So congratulations. Thank you, Dr. R. Before we start, what should our listeners in one line know about you? I think what many people find strange with me and my career choice is that I started out as a nephrologist and the most common feedback that I get is I don't even sound like a nephrologist anymore, including when residents and fellows present cases to me, you know, discussing cases on call and interacting with other colleagues. They find that I tend to use a lot of terminologies and I tend to have the attitude of what they would expect out of a cardiologist. And I almost, you know, sound like some kind of a mix or a mash between those two specialties. And that is exactly what I hoped, you know, I would turn out to be because of my interest in cardiorenal medicine, which is, you know, a cross or a transdisciplinary field. And I think that underscores the importance of cross training. And when you want to excel in a field that is a hybrid field like cardiorenal medicine, I think it really takes the understanding that not only do you have to train in one you know, primary specialty, you have to spend a lot of time thinking about the other specialty and really cross-train, including training with mentors and leaders in the other field that you are partnering with to really look at things from their perspective. So I think, you know, if there was maybe two pieces of good advice that I would give residents or fellows or anybody who wants to go into cardiorenal medicine, I think the first thing is to be willing to cross-train. You really can't be a nephrologist and then go and train with another, even a really outstanding or great nephrologist, and become a good cardiorenal physician. You have to cross-train with the other specialty. You have to work with people in advanced heart failure and interventional cardiology. Look at things from their side. And that's how you get a 360-degree view of this field. And I think that is the key to success in this field. The second and most other important piece of advice for people starting out, I would say, is when you choose a mentor in cardiorenal medicine, the same rules apply, which is if you just keep choosing mentors within your own subspecialty, meaning a cardiologist training another cardiologist or the same thing in nephrology, we really will still be working in our respective silos. We really have to, again, embrace that crosstalk. And on that note, I've been very fortunate to have uh, collaborators and mentors like uh, Peter McCullough, who is a cardiorenal physician leader, you know, from um, Baylor Hospital in Dallas and other mentors like Claudio Ronco. These are all some of the greats in this field. And that that crosstalk with a person who's not in my specialty is what has actually made me understand some of the nuances of those fields really well. So I would really say to some of the people starting out, you know, really be willing to listen to the other side. And that is the first step to success in this field. That is great advice. I actually do uh, agree with you. The AHA scientific statement that you authored has collaboration through multiple different specialties, which is actually what makes it so robust and makes it so comprehensive. 
Yes, and uh, you know, and this is you, you'll see that there is an explosion of many of these hybrid fields. You know, there's cardio oncology, which has a fairly well established presence today. There's cardio obstetrics. You know, there's cardio nephrology. There's onco nephrology, and the important thing I think people you know fail to realize is you know when you have uh, when you go into a field that is already well established, for example, electrophysiology or interventional cardiology, there's a very set pathway. You know, there are certain milestones you have to hit, but it's very, very predictable. You know how to get from point A to B to C. If you say, I have an interest in cardiorenal medicine, you have to realize it is an evolving field. And that's what actually makes it fascinating because you grow as the field grows and you grow when you collaborate with non if i'm a nephrologist and i collaborate with non nephrology thinkers it is such a fertile ground for some really nice ideas that have high impact and that i think is what actually drives me to do this i must say there is not a dull moment you know the aha cardiorenal you know scientific statement which is the first scientific statement on this topic i must say nobody learned more than i did during the work on that project for the same reason yeah. So with that note, I think I'll I'll just summarize what cardiorenal syndrome entails, yeah, and then then we can talk a little bit more about it. Cardiorenal syndrome really encompasses a spectrum of diseases involving both the heart and the kidneys, and you have acute or chronic dysfunction in one organ that induces acute or chronic dysfunction in the other organ. And and we've always known about this. There is a very strong confluence of interactions between the heart and the kidney across various interfaces. The commonest one we usually talk about is a hemodynamic crosstalk between the failing heart and the response to kidneys and vice versa. But there are additional alterations in neurohormonal markers, inflammatory molecular signatures that are fairly characteristic of the clinical phenotype of cardiorenal syndrome. Dr. R., what are the different types of cardiorenal syndromes that we talk about in clinical practice? So it's actually an interesting question because people, when they say, the classification of cardiorenal syndrome, the first thing that comes to their mind is, you know, the well-popularized uh, classification by the ADQI, which is the Acute Dialysis Quality Initiative, where they classify it basically into two categories. One is cardiorenal, where the primary organ of failure, also called the prima movens, meaning that is the organ driving the disease, is the heart. And then renal cardiac, where the prima movens is the kidney. And then that is further subdivided into acute and chronic. So type 1 CRS is when you have acute heart failure with kidney dysfunction. Type 2 is when it's a more indolent phenotype. Um, you know, 3 and 4 are the acute and chronic renal cardiac syndromes. And 5 represents, you know, multi-organ or secondary cardiorenal syndromes with simultaneous cardiac and renal involvement. Now, you have to realize that this description didn't just come out of nowhere. In fact, the first um, annotation in the literature that we have of any crosstalk between the heart and the kidney comes from as early as 1836 from uh, the notes of Sir Richard Bright, who is widely regarded as the father of nephrology, where he pointed out significant structural changes in the hearts of patients uh, in autopsy findings who had died um, and they had advanced kidney disease. And since then, there's been a rich body of literature, um, you know, describing, like you said, you know, hemodynamic changes, inflammatory crosstalk, neurohormonal markers. But again, the, the, the lack of terminology was a very big problem because you might say one thing and I might, you know, interpret it a certain way and we may not be saying the same thing. So the first time there was a formal attempt to classify cardiorenal syndrome actually came in 2004 uh, from a working group at the NIH. And that was then further built on, and then we have the present ADQI classification. And actually, given some of the recent changes in this field, it is highly anticipated that there will be the need to reclassify some of what we know, the way the ADQI looks today. So that, that's kind of, you know, where we are right now. And some of these uh, categories also seem to overlap. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. You know, it's very easy to take a table and write type 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And it's not like patients come in those boxes just because you put, you know, a classification and a certain type in a box. Not only that, um, two phenotypes may look very similar. And for clinical and practical purposes, 
it really may not even be necessary to distinguish the two. And I think a good example would be a patient with type 2 cardiorenal syndrome and type 4 cardiorenal syndrome. You know, they're, they both represent the chronic spectrum of cardiorenal syndrome. And whether the heart came first or the kidney dysfunction comes first, you know, at some point I've asked myself, does it really matter? Because ultimately, whatever goal-directed therapies you're going to offer the patient, whether it be to optimize pump function or reduce progression of renal disease, they're probably going to be the same anyway. I think the bang for the buck with this classification is really being able to separate out the type 1 CRS phenotype. Mm -hmm. You know, that is the one mistake we really don't want to make where there is a hospitalized patient and that type 1 CRS patient that really needs the most attention to detail is missed or misdiagnosed or not treated properly because of an improper diagnosis. The overlap is inevitable. You know, classifications are not perfect. They're a starting point. And I think it is important, and I use the ADQI classification in practice every day. You know, I like to sort it out in my mind, is this an acute deterioration? Is this chronic? And I really try to, you know, separate out that type one before anything else. But you're right. Sometimes the distinguish, the distinguishing factors like between two and four can become difficult. And that is also one of the reasons why some of the key opinion leaders and stakeholders feel that with some of the more uh, with some of the knowledge that we've gained with the use of biomarkers, um, you know, imaging and other precision medicine tools, there is probably now a good opportunity to try to uh, refine this classification and take it one step higher and make it more precise. Absolutely. And I think I should probably do it more in clinical practice where define the type of cardiorenal syndrome I'm thinking. Though I will say for inpatient medicine, like you said, we do deal with type 1 cardiorenal syndrome, which is really acute cardiac dysfunction res- resulting in uh, kidney injury mm-hmm. and uh, something we commonly see in the admitted heart failure patients. One of the things we note is that when we do treat these decompensated heart failure patients that are admitted to the hospital, there are commonly changes that occur in the patient's creatinine. And while we're usually diuresing these patients or adding neurohormonal blockade agents, we do see some changes in creatinine, not marked in most cases. How uh, do you interpret these changes in creatinine, and do they commonly reflect tubular injury? That's probably the most important uh, aspect of cardiorenal medicine. And if there's one thing I think we should get right together as cardiologists and nephrologists, it is to understand the significance of small fluctuations in markers of kidney function, glomerular and, uh, you know, uh, of glomerular filtration. And again, to give some perspective to this, um, you know, acute kidney injury is a devastating disease. It is highly prevalent in critically ill patients. Uh, the etiology is varied, you know, from sepsis to drug-induced injury to chemotherapeutic agents to um, shock, uh, cardiogenic shock, and so forth. The, the terminology for acute kidney injury historically also was very nebulous. You know, words like renal failure, acute renal failure, um, acute on chronic disease, and they were all just being thrown out. And, you know, a lot of papers were being published without actually agreeing on how to even define kidney injury. So one huge step in the right direction was when um, the Acute Kidney Injury Network came up with the Aiken, the, the classification of um, kidney injury. And the a modification of this was then uh, used and adopted by KDGO in 2012. And the KDGO criteria are, you know, widely recognized as the right way to describe changes in serum creatinine, urine output, et cetera, in terms of defining acute kidney injury. Now, that was a great step in the right direction for the field of AKI. The problem is that doesn't just, you know, you can't just import those criteria straight into a patient with heart failure because what ends up happening is the, the pathophysiology of the same, you know, increase in serum creatinine by 0.3 milligrams per deciliter in somebody with septic shock is very different from somebody with cardiorenal syndrome who is diuretic sensitive and who is well perfused and is decongesting beautifully. 
The same, you know, elevation in creatinine could be from escalating RAS inhibition, which is appropriate goal-directed therapy in acute heart failure. It could be because you hit a point of impaired plasma refill when you're diuresing the patient on consecutive days, and you may just need to slow it down and give them a brief diuretic holiday. They all have completely different prognostic implications, and they all cannot be treated as one, and I think that is the biggest mistake we make. So on that note, I think there was a great uh, series of data from last year, and the one study that I think that was done really well is from Jeffrey Testani's group by uh, lead author um, Ahmad et al., and what they found was uh, in the ROSE heart failure platform, they looked at validated biomarkers of tubular injury, and they found that there was no uh, correlation between changes in markers of tubular injury uh, with uh, markers of glomerular filtration, such as changes in serum creatinine and cystatin C. Now, interestingly, the patients in that in that analysis that actually had the highest serum creatinines and cystatins actually had the lowest mortality at uh, at one year. Now, I think this is such a huge lesson for nephrologists, and this is another example of where I say if you really don't work with the other side and you don't cross-train, these concepts are lost because you, you know, just keep going through the same mental algorithm for, oh, this is AKI, and thus we must, of course, we must back off on diuretics, and of course, we must eliminate uh, other agents that make you pre-renal, such as RAS inhibitors, which would be absolutely the wrong thing to do. Uh, I think that is probably the heart and soul of getting a patient with cardiorenal syndrome decongested and on appropriate goal-directed medical therapy is to know where to get worried about these fluctuations. That's completely true. And like you said, it's been reflected in clinical practice where small changes in creatinine, people tend to start worrying and start backing off therapies that are actually helping the patient. One of the other things with these heart failure patients that we see in the hospital is what hemodynamic actually is responsible for the acute kidney injury in a lot of these patients. And I always, early on, placed a large focus on cardiac output. I used to think these patients just don't have enough cardiac output, which is Mm -hmm. probably resulting in the kidney injury in these patients. But the data actually may disagree with what I just said. So I think when it comes to hemodynamics, what would you say are the key hemodynamic parameters uh, in decompensated heart failure patients that tend to cause acute kidney injury and correlate more with the extent of kidney injury in these patients. You're absolutely right, where I think the perception uh, of worse, the etiology of worsening kidney function tends to be more uh, related to the thought that maybe they're in a low flow state. Uh, in fact, there is uh, there are some good data from the ADHERE registry that show when patients uh, even with advanced heart failure come and decompensated, they're normotensive to even hypertensive. Uh, and they have no signs or features of hypoperfusion uh, on admission when they come in with acute heart failure. Uh, one of the key uh, physiological concepts we should remember is you know, the kidney is on the end of a low resistance circuit with uh, greater than 25% of the cardiac output going to these organs. There are some old um, data, you know, by Merrill et al., where they elegantly showed that you may have large reductions in renal blood flow when a patient has decompensated heart failure. However, you still have near preservation of their baseline glomerular filtration rate. And how do you explain that phenomenon? So when renal blood flow goes down, how are you able to maintain your GFR? You do that because there is a concomitant increase in filtration fraction And this happens because you have efferent arteriolar constriction that is able to maintain that filtration fraction because your renin levels go up. And again, you have to remember that there's going to be a breaking point for all these compensatory changes. So even in the setting of acute heart failure, you may have lower renal blood flow, but your GFRs are maintained because you have this increase in filtration fraction. Obviously, there's a breaking point to that. And when you hit that point, Uh, when you truly are in a low flow state, then your renin levels being as high as they are now actually cause afferent or pre-glomerular vasoconstriction, and then you start seeing a drop in filtration fraction resulting in worsening renal function. So that has to be an almost extreme situation to break that barrier. The predominant physiology, and we know this from, you know, some very nice uh, seminal data from several groups, uh, 
you know, is likely mostly driven by Venus, renal venous congestion. There is one of the landmark papers from uh, Wilson Tang's group, uh, Wilfried Mullins and Wilson Tang from Jack 2009, where they show in patients with uh, advanced decompensated heart failure, uh, you know, the correlation between CVPs and uh, renal outcomes. Uh, so I really think that, you know, the right-sided part of the disease predominates as the driving hemodynamic insult. And the, the low flow state is probably overrated, but it is imperative that we have a really good judgment on admission. And as we titrate medications uh, using, um, you know, non-invasive markers, clinical markers, and when appropriate, invasive monitoring, you know, to be able to ensure that we're not missing a low flow state. But I really think the renal venous congestion part predominates. In practice, when we're trying to assess the volume status for a heart failure patient, we look for pedal edema, we look for crackles on lung auscultation, we listen for DS3 on heart exam, but one underused skill remains looking for the jugular venous pressure. Why it's important is because the jugular venous pressure tends to correlate best with the central venous pressure. And as we've spoken extensively so far, the central venous pressure is really one of the most important correlates for outcomes in these heart failure patients. To piggyback on that, I would also say it is uh, prime time for us to incorporate assessing jugular venous distension columns using point of care ultrasound. There's always going to be that difficult to examine patient uh, where and then you can't tell if this is arterial and you can't tell if it is venous. Uh, if there is one great, beautiful bedside application of point of care ultrasound, and there's many in the patient with cardiorenal syndrome, I think the first starting place should be to confirm what you think is the column with point of care ultrasound. Yep, that's true. One of the things I've seen uh, that helps is I, I know a patient's volume overloaded because everything says the patient's volume overloaded. I look at the JVP. And then when you treat them, it actually gets better. You can see the drop in the JVP level. And uh, I think that's also a good marker. If you're not sure initially, usually if you have everything else that agrees with you, you can, you can start learning how to do these JVP assessments in a lot of these patients. Because at the end of the day, like you said, it's with practice. I definitely struggled early on, and I think I've gotten better at it now, but I think I can still get better at it more. So do it more, and we'll learn about it as we go on. I completely agree. Uh, I think our patients with cardiorenal syndrome represent patients that need more than one good physical exam a day. Don't you agree? Um, yeah. You may have um, a patient with a very brittle curve where in the morning, you know, they're overloaded. And by the end of the day, they could actually be underfilled. So, you know, uh, one of the problems we have with the way our schedules are structured and, you know, competing time interests is we don't always go back and see the results of what we decided we would do on morning rounds. Yeah. You know, you go there, you make a certain assessment, you all agree on a great plan, and then you implement it, and then you actually have to get feedback on what you did. And there's the only way you get feedback is you go back again a few hours later and try to assess, you know, is this patient diuretic sensitive? Are they underfilled? Is there a difference? between our morning exam and our evening exam. And I think a patient with cardiorenal syndrome, at the bare minimum, requires at least two exams a day during a work day, you know, for this particular reason. No, that's very true. And I, I usually tend to go back, you know, to, uh, second half of the day, see if what I did in the morning actually works. Exactly. Uh, I think that brings us to other aspects uh, beyond CVP, beyond cardiac output and the direct hemodynamic effects that the heart seems to have on the kidneys. We're just going back to the pathophysiology of cardiorenal syndrome. What other aspects uh, would you say result in this acute kidney injury beyond these usual hemodynamic things? You know, I think when you look at the pathophysiology, while we tend to draw these nice pictures and flowcharts of all the different aspects, you have to remember that they're all happening at the same time. It's not like, you know, obviously congestion drives the disease and it also drives the other pathways. Uh, but as, you know, congestion is building up and you go from subclinical to clinical congestion, 
you are having in parallel activation of the neurohormonal axis, and under that you have specifically um, overdrive of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system of the sympathetic nervous system, and a huge inflammatory cascade, and they're all happening simultaneously. Uh, in fact, at the American Society of Nephrology's um, meeting last year, uh, we, uh, you know, we were discussing in a panel uh, about this this whole phenomenon of how going after inflammatory markers. Um, in heart failure has kind of been somewhat of a disappointing um, end path. And uh, Jeffrey Tastani pointed out that, you know, he has some um, observational data on patients where if they had cardiorenal syndrome and they were somewhat diuretic resistant to uh, best practices in using diuretics, giving them an anti-inflammatory agent like steroids actually made them diuretic sensitive, which I thought was really intriguing. And the question is whether, you know, we are addressing, you know, some component of intrarenal inflammation that may be happening and act, being activated in these patients that may be also driving that diuretic resistance in addition to other hemodynamic parameters. And it almost seems counterintuitive to take a patient that is volume overloaded with, you know, in acute heart failure with cardiorenal syndrome and give them steroids. But I just thought that was a very interesting observation. Obviously. We need high quality data before we start using something like that in a standardized fashion. But it just goes to show that all these three pathways are working simultaneously. That's a great uh, observation. I actually wasn't aware of that, but they're very interesting. It's very small scale data from what I understand, but I, I thought that it was intriguing. On the second note, I think this is also why we need to remind ourselves about goal directed medical therapy in acute heart failure. That is such a big missed opportunity. The first reflexive thing you see when an acute a patient with acute heart failure gets admitted, they have they come in with cardiorenal syndrome. You're decongesting them. Uh, it is very possible that the admitting team will have either held whatever RAS inhibition they are on, or the MRA, uh, or at least de-escalated the dose. And almost never will you see them increase the dose and optimize these doses in the hospital. Uh, mostly out of fear, and it comes from a good place. I don't want to be critical, and you know, I don't want to sound negative, but it's coming from a place where they don't want to do harm. The harm is actually not giving these appropriate agents in the setting of acute heart failure, which is the stepping stone for future exacerbations of acute heart failure. Yep. And when used correctly, when used in a well-perfused patient with careful monitoring, these agents actually have mortality benefits that are well known. And I think that is also, and if you think about it, you know, go back to the pathophysiology. Here's why. Because if you don't treat all the components, you just go after congestion, which also we don't do a great job of treating anyway. You go after congestion and you forget to the other pathways. We're not going to optimize that patient and keep them out of the hospital. Yeah. And, uh, you know, actually that, Reminds me, that's a great point because in decompensated heart failure patients, while we're focusing on their diuretics, we also have data now from Pioneer Heart Failure that looked at using Entresto among inpatient heart failure missions and found that there was quite a significant benefit that they saw pretty early on by using angiotensin receptor neprolysin inhibitors in the hospital, initiating them in the hospital. So certainly, as you said, there is, there is certainly a role for neurohormonal blockaded uh, usage and sort of titration in the hospital as well for these patients. Absolutely. And in fact, in Pioneer, you know, they showed um, the, 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 the data on changes in pro-BNP. And I think a decrease in these levels was apparent as early as within a week of, yep. you know, starting the, the RNAs and then discharging patients. And even though it was not the primary outcome of interest in their secondary um, exploratory outcomes. They actually did show a significant reduction in heart failure rehospitalizations after in-hospital initiation of the ARNI. So also, these are all just missed opportunities. We have, you know, these drugs that make sense, that work well, that have demonstrated benefits. And I think it is our cultural framework. And like we just discussed earlier, our, we're married to these changes in serum creatinine more than we are married to the huge body of evidence that goal-directed medical therapy works, not just in the chronic setting, but also in the acute setting.
That brings us brings us to the next uh, aspect of things. So we use, I think, BNP or pro-BNP, depending on the hospital I think you're working at, for all these acute heart failure patients, at least in the early identification phase. I think the data is not that great for following these levels and treating goals uh, based on your BNP level. But beyond these usual cardiac markers, those being really BNP troponins, are there any kidney biomarkers that you think are helpful in this situation? And could you tell us a little bit more about maybe some of these biomarkers? Absolutely. So, um, uh, you know, many advanced heart failure and even general cardiologists probably don't spend a lot of time thinking about kidney injury biomarkers, but I do think somebody with an interest in cardiorenal syndrome needs a working knowledge of biomarkers that are relevant to both organs. There's been a lot of growth in the field of biomarkers in kidney injury. You know, we have markers of glomerular filtration, markers of tubular injury plasma markers, urine markers, and a lot of these are now well studied and validated in certain models of acute kidney injury, notably uh, sepsis and probably drug-induced kidney injury. Those are the two models that have the most data. So some of the biomarkers that you will hear about, there's one called NGAL, which stands for neutrophil gelatinase associated lipocalin. Uh, which is a small protein that is found in neutrophil granules and is secreted by the renal tubular epithelium, even secreted by myocardial cells and other organ sites. Um, you know, it is one of the most upregulated proteins uh, in the setting of acute kidney injury. Uh, there's another um, combination of two markers, uh, which is available under the you know, commercial name of Nephrocheck which is also available for clinical use, and it's a combination of two markers, one which is called TIMP2, or tissue inhibitor of metalloproteinase 2, and uh, insulin-like growth factor uh, binding protein 7. These are both markers of cell cycle um, arrest, uh, you know, which happens in the early phase of cell injury. So both NGAL um, and uh, this uh, combination of these two biomarkers, Neprocheck, are available for clinical use uh, you know, these are, again, it's a growing field, and, uh, you know, different people have different levels of experience with these. In the cardiorenal syndrome world, I think if the, the biomarker that probably has the most data is NGAL. Um, you know, there was a published meta-analysis of 10 studies involving over 2,000 patients with uh, cardiorenal syndrome, where they looked at serum and urine and gal measurements, and w- which had very good predictive value for the need for dialysis and death. Serial measures of these urine markers in acute heart failure increased the predictive value for AKI. And, you know, perhaps the biggest utility in my mind to kind of go back to our discussion on how people are reluctant to escalate goal-directed medical therapy in acute heart failure, I think the predictive value of these very sensitive biomarkers uh, and the, the biggest yield is actually in their negative predictive value, meaning if you have a patient who's decongesting well, they're hypertensive, they're well perfused, and you want to escalate the ACE, ARB, or introduce an ARNI in that admission. And as you do so, you notice a subtle increase in their serum BUN and their serum creatinine. And now you're, you know, thinking, should I, should I not? And you know that you should, but you're a little worried because you see this bump in creatinine. Um, and you want to make sure, you know, you're not doing any harm. It would be beautiful if you could, you know, get a spot NGAL. And if the NGAL came back below a certain cutoff and you were confident the patient didn't have tubular injury, that would make the clinician that much more confident and say, this is a functional change in filtration markers. I am going ahead with escalating the dose and you would feel much better doing it, um, you know, with a little more guidance. And I really think urine biomarkers can play a very important role there. Yeah, I think that's something we should probably start using more and more uh, in practice as more and more data comes uh, through as well for these markers. So one of the things I think all heart failure patients will get is an echo at some point in time, you know, and, and, and we have both heart failure reduced ejection fraction, heart failure preserved ejection fraction that would present with volume overload and warm and wet as we call them. So we're, we usually assess these systolic diastolic markers in most of these patients, come to a conclusion about what's going on with the heart. We'll look at the IVC in these patients. But one of the things I found fairly intriguing 
and and actually quite fascinating in the paper is uh, when you talk about using renal imaging, renal ultrasonography, using intrarenal flow patterns to sort of identify some of these other things we're missing in normal echo about what's really going on in the kidney level. Because I'll look at the IVC and say, oh, okay, I think, you know, the CVP is high, so the kidneys are congested, and make a decision. But certainly uh, don't usually, in my practice, use renal imaging in a large proportion of the cases. Do you think there's a role for renal imaging in CRS or cardiorenal syndrome? And if yes, do you favor certain certain tests? That's a great point. I think... Um the, the way to utilize renal imaging in patients with cardiorenal syndrome, and a lot of this information can even be, as I said, done by point of care ultrasound, uh, which has so much value in uh, the bedside exam and, you know, follow up if, of patients with cardiorenal syndrome. I think the first thing I usually end up looking at is to gauge a sense of acuity or chronicity. Like you said, you know, patients can come uh, and, you know, they don't necessarily fit into a certain phenotype of cardiorenal medicine. And sometimes you, you think this is all acute and everything says acute. And then when you actually image the kidneys, you see they're shrunken close to end stage right off the bat. That changes a lot of the therapeutic strategies that you might use in that patient. I also think um, that, that there is a role for intrarenal uh, Doppler waveform assessment, although this is not a standard approach in any way. There was some a very nice paper by Aida et al. that looked at different intrarenal venous flow patterns as measured by Doppler ultrasound, and they showed um, that you know they correlated with right atrial pressures and as well not just right atrial pressures but also clinical outcomes. You know, it, it, I think they had a little over 200 patients hospitalized with acute heart failure. And over half of those subjects showed what's called a continuous intrarenal venous flow pattern, which um, in the, those patients invariably had low right atrial pressures with really good survival over 95% of one year. In contrast, about a quarter of those patients had discontinuous venous flow patterns with increased right atrial pressures, and they had the worst prognosis where their survival was, le- was less than 40% at one year. So I do think, um, you know, I don't know that these in isolation per se would be a game changer. But again, cardiorenal syndrome, the reason why we even went through all these different diagnostic modalities is when you put them together, every piece of information is one step closer. And when done properly and interpreted correctly, really helps you get closer and to a much more precise phenotype of what you're looking at in that patient. So if you just take a tubular biomarker, that per se is not going to change the landscape of heart failure. Same thing for renal imaging, you know, but when you thoughtfully put all these pieces of information together along with a really good experienced clinician's assessment, I think it can work wonders. And, you know, that kind of multimodality approach, I think, has the, you know, gives us the opportunity to be really precise with how we treat these patients. And like you said, you know, most of the patients, we don't need some of this information. It's really for those select patients that we really struggle with uh, assessing their volume status, assessing whether we're actually doing the right thing, that uh, these these additional testing might actually give us an edge or, or offer some advantage. Absolutely. And uh, the, the, the nice thing about things like Dopplers and biomarkers is that they're non-invasive. So people would definitely feel, you know, comfortable reaching out for them. But again, there's a learning curve to these things. Um, You know, in my own practice, I've only recently started, you know, with the use of NGAL. And, you know, you really have to understand how to use a biomarker is only as good as the person who's interpreting the biomarker. You know, the same biomarker, if you don't know what to do with it, you would actually end up doing more harm to the patient. uh, And you would end up treating a biomarker and not the patient. So I think. These are all good, you know, examples of where I think you really have to know how to put all these things together. And like you said, we have to be specific, you know, we have to be mindful of hospitalization costs. We have to be mindful of the huge financial burden of cardiorenal syndrome. And we have to be careful what patients we select, what tests to offer. And then uh, going back to what you said, I think it's fair to say that there is really 
no role of using invasive hemodynamics in our heart failure patients. And we've known that from data from multiple studies, ESCAPE, I think, being the most famous. What we've shown is that using invasive hemodynamics in managing these regular decompensated heart failure patients really does not offer an advantage. And as we know, uh, these invasive tests are low risk, but they are not risk free. Maybe in situations where you have really significant right-sided failure or pulmonary hypertension or you're concerned that these patients are in cardiogenic shock, have severe valvular disease that makes the interpretation of the disease, underlying disease, more complex and uh, makes it more challenging. I think it's fair to use it in those select cases. But invasive hemodynamics have really uh, fallen out of favor in use in most of our heart failure patients. I completely agree. I also do think that when, at least in my experience of working with um, advanced heart failure cardiologists, I, I really see that, uh, and I really see the benefit of using it appropriately in all the situations that you just mentioned, because you could keep going around in circles and, you know, with significant diuretic resistance for day after day after day, only to insert, you know, only to get right heart cath numbers and realize that the patient had borderline cardiac output all the time, and they clinically didn't quite look like they were in a low flow state. So sometimes these are, you know, there's sometimes you just need those numbers. And, uh, you know, as a nephrologist, I'm one of the people that actually you know, orders or requests of a fair number of right heart cat numbers. And I think, you know, the classic example would be where you you think you've done everything clinically appropriate in a patient with cardiomyal syndrome that is diuretic resistant. I think at some point you're going to hit the point where you need those numbers. Yes. And I think that brings us to the next point we're going to discuss is that when do you go to that next test? When is it going to benefit you? That reasoning will come when you set yourself goals in the management of these patients. It's mm-hmm. it's like, okay, I'm going to try this. Okay, if this doesn't work, I'm going to go up by the end of the day today. Two days from now, if this is not working, I'm going to get a right heart cath. And I think progression of sort of your thought pattern and managing these patients really brings forward the appropriate usage of uh, these tests only when we think we've really done uh, what we should have done, at least the basic minimum, to help these patients. Absolutely. There has to be a thought process. And what is, I think, a sad state of affairs is go to any hospital and there's going to be a protocol or algorithm for so many diseases that have probably, you know, morbidity and mortality in a similar to patients with cardiorenal syndrome or maybe even less. And they have everything protocolized, you know, for sepsis, you know, for resuscitation. There are protocols for wound care. There are protocols for everything you can name. You know, tell me about a place where an institution has agreed on best clinical practices for decongestion as one of their goals. You know, it's one of those things where it is so cookbook and everyone has their own recipe for how to do this. No two people decongest in the same way. And it is almost something like it's just passed on from one person to the other. We do not, at least, and and I'm not saying that we should all decongest the same way. All of us, if there's a science and an art to it. Having said that, I think there should be some uniformity and some basic clinical measures have to be taken. You know, common mistakes like taking a patient with clinical, you know, decompensated heart failure, bringing them into a hospital and using diuretics that dosing that is actually less than their outpatient dosing. You see this all the time. You see patients sit, you know, with heart failure in a hospital and for 24 hours they have not received a single dose of a diuretic. Appropriate escalation and dosing has not happened. If a patient hasn't responded to your initial strategy, escalation of dosing is not thought through. You know, patients sit in a hospital with a diagnosis of heart failure and actually gain weight. I I think those things are just unacceptable. And, you know, in that situation, obviously going and getting right heart cath numbers is not Okay, I think what is really important is that we have a quick, you know, and efficient and simple approach that any clinician, even a non-cardiologist and a non-nephrologist should be able to start so that basic mistakes are not made. So I think that brings me to the next question that I found very interesting throughout my training. And um, I think my wife still jokes about it uh, when I'm using diuretics or I'm talking to someone over the phone about the plan. And she's like, you've been training for 14 years and and you still don't know exactly what diuretic and how much diuretic to use (laughs) and how to give it. 
how much diuretic would you typically recommend starting a patient on? And do you have a preference for drip or bolus? Is there a specific scenario you sort of grab one of those options? Again, this is one of those areas where I think you speak to different, um, you know, leaders and experts and, you know, clinicians, and they will all say different things. I think as a standard approach, assuming your patient is well perfused and they are clearly in heart failure, most of, you know, published data, including in some of the seminal reviews on this topic, like, you know, the one from Michael Felker in the New England Journal last year would say, you want to start somewhere between two to three times their home dose. Most people go on the lower end of that, and they at least double the dose uh, and give it intravenously. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think we have a good uh, RCT-based answer for the, um, you know, bolus uh, intermittent dosing versus continuous. And, you know, that comes from the dose heart failure trial. Um, and in the interest of not necessarily adding to nursing burden and um, uh, even potentially length of stay, I don't necessarily push for continuous infusions. But here's where I really struggle with, you know, even though theoretically you know that intermittent dosing is as effective, it's again, we run into these uh, cultural and mindset blocks. You know, when you really order high doses of loop diuretics that you know are appropriate, for mm -hmm. this patient, given their personal outpatient diuretic history, uh, they have failed a few steps before you've tried salvaging them, bringing them to the clinic and giving them, you know, outpatient intravenous diuretics. They've failed that. Now they're in the hospital. So you know that you have to be more aggressive. When you start ordering these big doses, you get, you know, pharmacy will reject the order, saying that that's too much of biometanide. Or mm -hmm. you will find that the dose is ordered and the nurse is very worried that they're giving this patient this high dose that they've never seen before, that they've never seen it before because nobody else has taught them that this is okay, you know. So it's all from a knowledge gap and with the intention of not harming, but what they, you know, you get a lot of resistance from different layers within the hospital. And it just gets frustrating after a while to keep repeating again and again, yes, that is not a typo. That's actually the dose of the diuretic I ordered. And so I've actually seen some clinicians just say, if you really want to deliver that cumulative dose of diuretic in 24 hours, when you order it in a drip, somehow people are psychologically okay with it dripping in small doses. Very but true. what they don't really understand is the same dose that you were giving, say you want to give 12 milligrams of bumetanide in 24 hours, you could, when you write it intermittently, it seems like a lot, but it's still the same thing. So again, I think it's, it's mindset, but I really don't think one is necessarily better than the other. And, you know, you don't really have to have an opinion because I think we have a good evidence-based answer to that question. And then and we're going to do a whole separate episode on diuretics where we'll tackle the type of diuretics and some of these questions in greater detail. W one of the things also that I think I don't see as much anymore, but early on, in fact, when I was training, was using ultrafiltration in some of these patients as an option for when you're really not responding to diuretics. Because as we know, and the concerns that exist, higher diuretics cause more neurohormonal activation. Maybe they have more side effects, greater changes in sort of your electrolytes. Uh, and ultrafiltration is an option that was supposed to sort of bail us out of these situations or maybe sometimes, you know, I, I think the question was, can it even be used as a first line in treatment? Uh, mm -hmm. Where would you place ultrafiltration in our treatment dialogue today? And do you think it has a role today that it had maybe several years ago before we had all this data? Yeah, you know, you're, you're absolutely right that, you know, when you were training uh, and that was probably, you know, in the period after unload came out, and before caress, you know, there was a lot of hope placed on the fact that ultrafiltration would actually be beneficial in terms of mitigating some of the RAS activation that you get with using high dose diuretics. And it would provide a more predictable way of getting rid of not just fluid, but actually sodium. And I think that that, that a distinction is very important. Uh, to that effect, there was actually a nice uh, paper that came out in Jack Hart Failure um, last month uh, by the Yale group where they actually showed that the natriuretic response to diuretics is highly variable. Again, this was an analysis from the Rose Heart Failure trial and that poor sodium excretors 
And this is not necessarily something that correlates with urine volume, but just when you measure sodium excretion, patients with heart failure that have impaired uh, ability to excrete sodium uh, have lower survival. And I think we have to really ingrain into our heads um, that it is, you know, we're all very impressed with urine volumes. But we have to realize that two patients may have the same urine output of four liters, but the sodium content can be very different. And one may be a high excreter and the other is low. And the patient with the four liters that you thought was doing as well as the other guy is probably not going to do as well. And I think that's what this study shows. So you ultrafiltration in that sense is a much more predictable way of uh, removing sodium when compared to loop diuretics. So theoretically, it makes a lot of sense. Except that when you actually test that in and many other ideas like this in a in a good randomized control trial, uh, which Caress heart failure was, and it was one of the few true cardiorenal trials we have because to have uh, to be included in Caress heart failure, you actually needed to have type one cardiorenal syndrome. There was no difference in their um, you know sort of primary clinical endpoints between the use of UF and high dose. Uh, loop diuretics. They had a very systematic protocol on how to escalate uh, diuresis, and clearly it is not based on caresses data. Uh, you cannot use it, or you cannot advise its use for uh, first-line therapy in patients with cardiorenal syndrome. I think caress made that clear. Avoid heart failure was another study that was designed to uh, look at the same question uh, with a somewhat different uh, protocol um, and used the same stepped-up algorithm that Caress did in their diuretic arm, but which unfortunately the study was stopped prematurely. So kind of left the field hanging in that place. I really think there is no role, as I just mentioned earlier, for ultrafiltration in type 1 cardiorenal syndrome as first-line therapy. There's always a patient that you will need to bail out with rescue ultrafiltration, the patient with true diuretic resistance. But again, from clinical experience, I can tell you that true diuretic resistance happens less frequently than you think. A lot of the reasons for the patient being diuretic resistant are modifiable between clinical judgment and protocols in the hospital, you know, where we don't effectively use diuretics. That sounds great. Yep. We already spoke about using some of our heart failure therapies in patients with acute kidney injury. I will just say that when we, when it comes to using some of these therapies in chronic heart failure patients with more advanced forms of chronic kidney disease, this is really those patients with GFRs that are really under 45, under 40, some even 30. I think that's where it gets a little more challenging in managing heart failure patients because uh-huh. some of these ACE inhibitors and MRAs especially do cause changes in patients' potassium and electrolytes. And sort of just gearing off to that side of things where patients with more advanced CKD and really CKD 4 to 5, I think we just have to be careful in our, in our management of heart failure. When we try to escalate these therapies, we should follow these patients' electrolytes very closely and follow the response very closely because it's that group of patients which probably are at a high risk for side effects uh, from these medications. Oh, I couldn't agree more. Uh, Unfortunately, that group, which is also the most sick and vulnerable, you know, people with a GFR of less than 30 or on dialysis with heart failure, that uh, represent the sickest in that whole spectrum of chronic cardiorenal syndrome. And in that GFR group is where a lot of high-quality data is also missing. So when you look at all the uh, other, you know, uh, pillars of evidence for the use of these major drug classes, um, you find that the, the evidence is very strong in patients, even with, you know, normal GFRs and, uh, you know, CKD1 and 2, and to some extent, even with CKD3. Once you go to the GFR of less than 30, everything is, you know, almost an extrapolation of what we think we should be doing with those patients. To come to your point of hyperkalemia, you're absolutely right. When you're working with compromised GFR and certainly with end-stage kidney disease, um, you know, maintenance of potassium balance and avoiding critical hyperkalemia is so important. I think what would be of interest to the cardiology side of this audience is to know that we now have two approved novel oral anti-hyperkalemic drugs. Uh, one of them is pateromer um, acetate, and the other is sodium zirconium uh, cyclosilicate. 
Um, and these two drugs are available and they're becoming increasingly available in many hospital formularies. And they're a very valuable tool uh, in a patient that is reliable, in a patient that is compliant and is amenable to follow up where you really feel you have room to introduce an MRA. You feel like you have room to escalate RAS inhibition, but you're just worried you're going to tip them over with hyperkalemia. Adding one of these novel oral antihyperkalemic drugs now gives you that liberty where you're really able to optimize these patients um, and still maintain normal kalemia. So I think this is something that from your side as, you know, advanced heart failure doctors, you're going to see this subgroup of patients all the time. I think you should start incorporating some of the, the use of those medications as adjunct therapies in your practice. Uh, that's a great point. I think I've usually just been backing off of or discontinuing the MRA when the GFR gets to under 30 because of the concerns for hyperkalemia. But we use it, uh, I think, inpatient all, a little bit more and uh, certainly probably should incorporate that into my practice, too. I know there's a whole exciting field of diabetic drugs, the GLP-1 agonists and the SGLT-2 inhibitors which tend to have a benefit not only for heart failure, but also chronic kidney disease. But we're trying to sort of do a separate uh, conversation for that. Do you want to say anything about the these drugs, which are relatively new in the market? Uh, I, I haven't prescribed them to my outpatients yet in the in the practice of more endocrinologists that have started using these drugs in their diabetic heart failure CKD patients. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, so I really think, and I completely agree that you should have a completely separate podcast episode because it warrants, you know, that much attention. The data, you know, from trials, very well done large scale trials, you know, the, the, the signal benefit is unmistakable. And of all the, you know, when they look at the primary composite outcomes and they look at the sub outcomes in terms of cardiovascular outcomes, probably across the board, reduction of hospitalization for heart failure was probably the one that, you know, accrued the most benefit that the patients in these trials accrued the most benefits for. So um, I think what you just also described is the is the mindset not that you have, but I think most cardiologists and even nephrologists are struggling with right now is they somehow feel that these drugs are out of their wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. They don't feel comfortable taking over a medication that is, you know, thought of to be as an anti-diabetic agent. Yeah. While actually the diabetic effects may be somewhat of a sideline and the primary benefit is actually cardiorenal. You know, if there's any class of drugs, you know, when you think of the SGLT2 inhibitors and the GLP-1 RAs that have primary benefits for uh, reduction of adverse cardiorenal outcomes, I think it's these classes. And we really have to get out of that mindset. You know, I share some of the concerns you have, which is, are we now taking ownership for these drugs? You know, are we going to have an endocrinologist prescribe it and we kind of piggyback with them? Um, mm -hmm. In fact, in our institution at Einstein, we recently had, you know, a think tank meeting to form a cardiorenal metabolic clinic for this reason. I think it's a learning curve and we just have to embrace that this is new knowledge we have and we can be left behind because we're not the ones being left behind. Our patients are going to be left behind if we don't push for them to go on these drugs. To expect endocrinologists who deal with what they deal with and expect them to take primary charge of reducing heart failure and reducing cardiorenal syndrome is just clinically impractical and unrealistic. And I think we can borrow from a lot of the knowledge they have, and we need to come up with our own clinical protocols on how to use these medications in a multidisciplinary fashion. And having internal teams, including, you know, a point cardiologist, a point endocrinologist, and a point nephrologist, um, you know, somebody, you know, who is constantly following up for potential side effects of these drugs and so forth. That's the way we should be thinking to actually make sure our patients that actually meet these criteria get these drugs. No, absolutely. Like you said, like we started this conversation today, collaboration is key today because there's so much going on and, and one person just cannot, I think, be an expert in everything at this point. We just have to work together for our patients and, and, and this is probably one of the best examples of where, you know, I'm, I'm talking about inpatient cardiorenal collaboration, but for outpatient cardiorenal metabolic risk reduction, I can't think of a better place to start, which is 
specialties that traditionally don't get involved in diabetes management, like cardiology and nephrology, where we've always deferred the management of this to the primary care physician or an endocrinologist, are now part of that central think tank. And I think because the outcome of interest is, you know, directly related to what we do, it's it's the bread and butter stuff of what we do. Yep. The last thing I wanted to touch base upon is something we don't talk about enough uh, especially with our heart failure patients and these patients with chronic kidney disease is using mm-hmm. palliative care in these patients really for symptomatic benefit. What is your uh, opinion on using palliative care in these patients and when do you typically uh, get them involved in your clinical practice? That is such an important point and unfortunately we end up not talking about this enough because you know everybody comes to cardiology conferences and renal conferences, they're all excited to hear about all the new stuff. You know, they want to hear about the new designer drugs. They want to hear about devices. They want to hear about all this, you know, and that's great. And I do too. But what we really don't address is there's always a point beyond which we're really not going to change the overall trajectory of the outcome for that patient. And given that the highest burden uh, you know, of cardiorenal disease, whether acute or chronic, is also seen in the elder, in the in the expanding elderly population. I think we have to be really cognizant. On the other hand, about two things. One is, where is this all? Where is the money coming for all these expensive therapies? And is this sustainable? I think that's one question we need to ask ourselves. The, and I think that should teach us to say just because a therapy or a device or a drug is available, it doesn't automatically mean every eligible patient is getting it because, again, we have to ask ourselves, where is this coming from and which part of money is this coming from? Yeah. And the second part is just because it is beneficial in a theoretical sense, is this patient in front of me actually going to benefit from some of these newer therapies? And I think we don't spend enough time actually trying to tease out what the patient and their family's hopes and expectations are from us. You know, we have a way of telling them, oh, there's this new medication, oh, there's this new device. But I think the first place to start out in a patient with chronic and progressive cardiorenal syndrome is what do you hope and what do you hope that our, your care team can actually do for you? And I think some of their answers really surprise you. In, in the dialysis literature, this has actually been studied. You know, I remember reading when I was a fellow, it was a C. Jason paper where they took a cohort of 600 patients that were, had started dialysis within the last year. And then they surveyed these patients uh, now that they had experienced what it was to go through dialysis for a year. And they asked them the question, if you knew um, what you do know now about the experience of dialysis and you had to do it all over again, uh, would you choose to go on dialysis? And close to 50% of patients said they would seriously consider not doing it. It, it just makes you think, you know, uh, there's what we think we're telling patients, and then there's what, you know, they really feel from their end that I think we don't hear back. And I think the first step we should do in an evaluation in these very sick, frail patients with advanced chronic cardiovascular syndrome, even if we continue to offer appropriate goal-directed therapies, et cetera, is I think we need to define outcomes the way they want outcomes to be defined, not the way we want them to be defined. And having, you know, patients and families involved and communicating that to us will really help us, you know, kind of get palliative care involved early. The other misconception, I think, is people assume palliative care means we are withdrawing everything and we're de-escalating everything, which is absolutely not true. A patient can be maintained on several appropriate medical therapies and still benefit from palliative care resources. And there's just a stigma that is attached to that, that I think we should really try to fill that knowledge gap because I think it is one of the most underutilized services in cardiorenal patients. That's very true. I think uh, every time I do involve them, I sometimes wish that uh, I had involved them a little bit sooner because they have so much to offer for these patients. Absolutely. Wow. That was a fantastic discussion today. And I know we went well over time, Dr. R, but we really appreciate you spending the time and sharing your thoughts with us. Before we let you go, though, today, we'll give you just an opportunity to put in any plugs that you want or anything you want to tell our listeners out there. Sure. Uh, first of all, thanks for this discussion. I really 
enjoyed it and it's 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 one of the most fulfilling things for me to be able to have this kind of crosstalk with my cardiology colleagues what i really hope is to see um i really hope that current and future trainees in internal medicine see the prospects and the growth opportunities and the excitement that the growing field of cardionephrology represents uh the field has generated a lot of recent interest uh for people who enjoy hemodynamics physiology patient centered care and working across specialties i think cardio renal medicine is such a perfect fit i really hope you know we attract the best of talent in this field and we can make a dent in the not so great outcomes that we have with people with cardio renal syndrome and that is probably you know attracting the best talent is going to be our only hope to be able to reduce you know the morbidity and you know the escalating healthcare costs with this disease so i really hope to see a lot of bright young minds be drawn into this field and i think it has a lot to offer them that's that's great advice dr r i always learn so much from you every time i talk to you so hopefully we get to do this again sometime in one of our future episodes but thank you dr r for your time thanks again and uh, have a great day thanks a lot mike always a pleasure That brings us to the end of another episode that we had a great time creating. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed our episode, don't forget to like, subscribe and give us a high rating as it helps other listeners find us. You can leave your suggestion for topics, critiques, things you think we can do better. You can email us at heartsuccessteam@gmail.com. At you can actually find us on our website at www.heartsuccess.info. Our website now also provides links to all the podcast providers where you can listen to this episode. You can find us on our Facebook page at Heart Success Team or you can always reach me on Twitter at Cardio Bro. Mm-hmm.